Socrates once stated that we should follow the argument wherever it leads. And I often state that we should check every claim that people throw our way. For example, we don't know that Socrates said this, but philosopher Plato says that he said it in his 4th century work, The Republic. As far as this video goes, that's as close to correct as the quotes are going to get. When we look at the most profound question of life, does God exist? We should certainly follow his advice. Agree. When we do, we'll find evidences that show us God is real. Oh, you're one of those plural of evidences, evidences guys. Let's look at six proofs that show God exists. Yep, let's do it. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Today, we're looking at six proofs for God's existence from World Video Bible School, hosted by one, um, Kyle Butt. 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 Now, now. Number one, the universe must have a cause. The most fundamental law of science is the law of cause and effect. Well, that's simply not true. While causality underlies scientific investigations and guides our understanding of how phenomena are connected, it is not a scientific law like Newton's laws or the laws of thermodynamics. Rather, causality is a foundational principle that helps shape scientific inquiry and forms the basis for exploring and explaining the relationships between events and phenomena in various scientific disciplines. And it says that for every material effect we see, there is a cause that came before it or was simultaneous to it, and that is greater than it. Normally, when people include quotation marks around a sentence in a presentation, it's because it's a direct quote from someone else. I searched for this quote, and all I could find was a religious Facebook group, a Bible flashcard quiz, a blog post that is actually just the script of this video, and a Quora post asking if this comment is true. All four are quoting Kyle, so it doesn't seem like Kyle is quoting anyone with relevant experience or qualification. Where Kyle's characterization of causation is correct, it is trivially true. The definition of an effect is a change which is a result or consequence of an action or other cause. It's definitionally true that an effect has a cause, in the same way it's definitionally true that a married person has a spouse. Adding the caveat to about simultaneous to it sounds like something I heard in a debate about cosmology years back, but can't quite place. It was to get around some materialistic objection. We'll see if it comes up today. In practice, outside of quantum physics, there is a finite temporal delay between causes and effects, even if it's too small to be perceived by our limited senses, like the delay between flicking a light switch and the lights coming on. However, it is important to note the magnitude or greater than aspect mentioned in the claim is meaningless. While causes can certainly have a relationship of influence or necessity over their effects, it does not necessarily imply that the cause is always greater in terms of magnitude or importance. A pebble shift is in no way greater than the avalanche it causes. The universe is a material effect. Well, that's quite a claim. I suppose it depends on what you mean by universe. If you mean our particular instantiation of space-time or the current configuration of matter around us, then sure. But if Cal means the cosmos, everything that is or ever was, well, then it'll have to show some work because that's not scientific consensus. So what caused the universe? You see, if you don't believe in a creator, then you have to suggest something like uh, a singularity. To be fair, there are a lot of people who believe in God and adopt a cosmology that includes a singularity. These are not mutually exclusive. That's what is popular today, that there was some type of singularity that exploded in something called the Big Bang. The fact that Kyle uses the word exploded here shows that he is not a serious person who is well-versed in the topic on which he speaks. The Big Bang was an an expansion event, more analogous to the inflation of a balloon than an explosion. The name Big Bang was given by someone making fun of the hypothesis, and it unfortunately stuck. And that has caused confusion for generations. But that's another story for another time. To say that the singularity caused the expansion event isn't precise either. In singularity cosmology models, matter and energy predated the expansion of space-time. But it's unclear what it would even mean to exist for time and how cause and effect would work outside of time. Kyle is using sloppy language for complex topics for which we don't have concrete language. But then when you try to get down to the bottom of what's a singularity, 
Well, what we hear from the scientific community that suggest to us, the, the cosmologists, they say, well, a singularity was something that popped into existence from nothing. No cosmologist says such a thing. In science, the term singularity refers to a point or region in space-time where the laws of physics break down or become undefined. It is a concept often encountered in the study of extreme physical conditions, such as at the center of a black hole or during the early moments of the universe. Ex nihilo, or out of nothing, is purely a philosophical or theological notion. Science rejects the idea that there ever was nothing in this philosophical sense. Do you know that if there ever were a time when there was nothing, that's exactly what we would have now? If there were ever a time where there was nothing, that would be true. But Kyle cannot demonstrate that there ever was such a time. The idea that something popped into existence from nothing is simply not a scientific idea. That is correct. It is not a scientific idea. It is a religious idea. You see, they're suggesting that that singularity is somehow natural, but it behaves supernaturally. They say that that singularity wouldn't have followed the laws of nature. The concept of a singularity, particularly within the context of extreme physical conditions like the center of a black hole, does challenge our current understanding of the laws of nature. It is an area where the known laws of physics, including general relativity, break down or become undefined. At a singularity, quantities such as density and curvature become infinitely large, and our current theories cannot accurately describe what happens. However, it's important to distinguish between the use of supernatural in a colloquial sense, which often implies something beyond the natural world and governed by supernatural forces, and its usage here to describe a phenomenon that lies beyond our limited current understanding of physics. The study of singularities remains an area of ongoing scientific investigation with the aim of better understanding the fundamental nature of the universe. Well then, so what are we left with? We're left with the fact that the universe had a beginning and it was not a natural cause. While our particular instantiation of space-time had a beginning, that doesn't mean that matter and energy had a beginning or that the cosmos had a cause of any kind. It was something above nature. It was something super nature something supernatural. And so when we see the material effect of the universe, we can know that there was a supernatural creator that caused the universe. Calling the universe an effect doesn't make it one any more than me calling God an effect would make him one. Christians like Kyle call God an uncaused cause, and I call material an uncaused cause. We both terminate our infinite regress in something we must accept as a brute fact. The difference is that I can demonstrate that my brute fact exists. Proof number two. Design demands a designer. It is a truism that everybody recognizes that this universe looks Design. A truism is a statement or proposition that is self-evidently true or commonly accepted as true without needing further proof or explanation. It is a statement that is often regarded as cliché or stating the obvious. What is a truism is that a design demands a designer. That is trivially definitionally true in the same way that an effect definitionally requires a cause. Everyone recognizing that the universe looks designed is not a truism. For example, the more I study the universe, the less designed it seems to me. People like me might be mistaken, but Kyle's statement doesn't apply to everyone, and so is false, nor is it helpful. One could equally say, everybody recognizes that the Earth looks flat. On a surface level, sure, our day-to-day -day interaction with the Earth is as a flat surface. But we now know that this is an illusion of perspective, not reality. So it is with this false intuition of design. Appealing to intuition is a common theme for Kyle. But how we feel about things is not a way of knowing things. In fact, when we see the various different aspects of nature, and we see birds and squirrels and trees, and we see all of the things that they do so well, many times we as humans, we try to copy and mimic that design. It'd be short-sighted of us to not take advantage of learning from the accumulated successes of millions of years of trial and error that came before us. But often we don't do nearly as well as the design that we see in nature. We look at the design of the human body and the human hand and the arm and the leg and the brain, and we see that those are some of the most advanced, technologically savvy 
pieces of equipment ever put together, and we try to mimic them and copy them, and we can't do it as well. Why? As I said, the bodies we have are the result of the accumulated successes of millions of years of trial and error, and so hold many excellent insights. But the human body has a lot of problems as well that we've spent generations trying to overcome with only limited success. And we're entering an era where electronic brains and bionic limbs will be better than our biological ones. Because this universe exhibits design from the starry sky at night to the fingertips on your hand. The design is overwhelming. It's everywhere. Again, this is just an appeal to our flawed and limited intuition. Where does design originate? Well, what you and I both know is that when you see things that function and they're complex, that design comes from an intelligent designer. Simplicity is the hallmark of great design, not complexity. Big explosions just simply don't bring about order. I mean, no one posits an explosion. So this kind of statement indicates that you don't know or don't care to accurately represent opposing viewpoint. Now, when it comes to organizing principles, gravity, electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear force are pretty much what we need to form galaxies from expanding matter. More sophisticated and scientifically literate Christians are aware of this and instead use these as their proofs for God. Perhaps an upgrade for your next video, Kyle. They don't cause things that are functional and complex to come into existence. The design we see in the universe demands a supernatural, intelligent designer. Again, Kyle didn't demonstrate design. He merely appealed to intuition. Proof number three. Life demands a supernatural life giver. You see, in the material world, we have come to understand that there is a law of biology called the law of biogenesis. Law of biogenesis simply says this, that in this material, natural world, life comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Again, Kyle has used quotation marks, and the only places where I can find this sentence are those same websites that were quoting Kyle earlier. This is a bad sign. The principle of biogenesis emerged as a scientific understanding in the 19th century through experiments and observations conducted by scientists such as Louis Pasteur and others. Their work helped refute the earlier notion of spontaneous generation, which proposed that living organisms could arrive spontaneously from inanimate matter under certain conditions. For example, when you open a bag of rice and find mice inside, it doesn't mean that some rice spontaneously became mice. Now, when we look at how people used to think about life, they said, no, life can arise spontaneously from non-living chemicals. And yet every single biological experiment has shown us that that simply is biologically impossible. Life doesn't arise from non-living chemicals. We now understand that the molecular building blocks and processes underlying life are ultimately merely chemical reactions. There is no hard and fixed line between chemistry and organic chemistry. It's a spectrum and part of the same study in the same way that chemistry is ultimately on the spectrum of physics. While we can't yet connect every dot, the notion that simple organic compounds like proteins, amino acids, and RNA emerged from inorganic chemical interactions is well accepted and even demonstrable. There is no physical limitation that would prohibit the further organization of these proteins, eventually replicating over the course of billions of years. It may well be that a supernatural agent involved themselves in the process, but there's nothing about the proposed process that requires one. Kyle wants to fill in the gaps in our knowledge with a god. But that hasn't gone well for gods in the past. From where did life arise? Where did life originate if it doesn't arise from non-living chemicals? You see, the idea that there's no God suggests to us that there had to be some singularity without a cause that exploded and that explosion brought about design which we've never ever seen happen. I don't need to continue to correct his misrepresentations, but here I will note that none of the proposed processes we've talked about would happen in a single lifetime. The fact that some things take longer than our short human lives doesn't mean that they don't happen. If Kyle were a mayfly, he would probably insist that houses always existed because in the two days he was alive, he never saw one built. And then ultimately, 
somewhere the non-living chemicals gave rise to life, but that's biologically impossible. It is absolutely not chemically impossible. Organic chemistry is real and demonstrable. Life is merely a point on the spectrum between chemistry and biology. Again, maybe human life was aided by a designer, maybe not, but Kyle did nothing to demonstrate impossibility of the natural emergence of the building blocks of life. Proof number four. Moral law demands a moral law giver. If some things are objectively morally right and other things are objectively morally wrong, then there must be a God. Well, Kyle, before I can weigh in on that question, I'm going to need some clarification on definitions first. When something is described as objective, it means that it is independent of personal opinion, biases, or individual perspective. If we first agree what portion of the light spectrum we're going to call red, then we can measure whether an object is red, even if there's no human around to interpret it. It would be objectively red. If we're going to make a call on objective morality, then we're first going to have to agree on a definition of morality. If Kyle's definition of morality includes the concept of God, then he's assuming his conclusion in the premise, and this argument means nothing at all. Not only that, but it would be a subjective morality because it is grounded in a subject, God. If Kyle means something else by morality, then we can have a discussion. For example, if morality is something like the measure of the potential for an action or thought to decrease harm or enable flourishing, then we have subjectively chosen a goal against which we can objectively evaluate thoughts and actions as moral. Such evaluation be imperfect, of course, but they could be endeavored. Kyle won't yield entirely to intuition, as he has done with all his arguments so far, then he's definitionally in the realm of subjective morality how we feel about it, regardless of how ubiquitous those feelings may or may not be. You see, if we evolve from primordial slime over multiplied millions of years, at what point did objective moral values arise? Well, around the time that any species started adapting cooperative survival strategy. Then, basic empathy becomes a survival advantage and a trait selected for. Most of what Christians call morality can be boiled down to Jesus' second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself which is just a restatement of biological empathy. We don't look at a dog and say that that dog objectively, morally violated some rule when he steals a bone from another dog. The fact that you bring up this example demonstrates that there is no such thing as universal, objective morality. If it did, it would need to apply to all creatures. If it's species-specific, it is subjective. And this point is already meaningless. We don't say, hey, he violated a objective moral value. We just don't say that. But we do say that humans can perpetrate things that are objectively morally wrong, that humans can be involved in things that are morally right. Right. So Kyle's definition of morality is subjective to humanity. Before humans existed and after humans die, Kyle's version of morality didn't and won't exist. If that's true... There must be a God. That doesn't follow, or at least Kyle did nothing but say so. But since he also failed to demonstrate that it's true, we can move on. Proof number five, free will exists. Okay, well, I hate to be pedantic, but now I'm going to need Kyle to define free will. In philosophy, free will generally refers to the capacity of rational agents to make choices and decisions that are not determined by external factors or pre-existing conditions. Free will doesn't ask if we are agents make choices. It's asking if we could have chosen otherwise under identical conditions. Personally, I hold to a philosophical position called determinism. That is, every event in the universe, including mental processes and human behavior, is the necessary result of antecedent causes and the laws of nature. Kyle presumably espouses libertarian free will, that individuals have the ability to make genuine choices that are not causally determined by prior events, external factors, or natural law. Earlier, Kyle was very excited about cause and effect. For his version of free will to be correct, we now need to throw that concept out the window. The atheistic idea that there is no God is founded on the idea of materialism. The idea that this material world is all that there is, all that there was, and all that there ever will be. Because of that, atheism has to suggest that you as a person don't really have free will. That there is no being inside of your body or brain that is super matter. It's not because of atheism that I suggest that we lack libertarian free will, other beings inside our bodies, and super matter in our brains. It's due to an abject lack of evidence 
for any of these things that I doubt them. I'm happy to be wrong in light of evidence. I'm not happy to accept these illusions as reality merely because Kyle's feelings and unexamined intuitions about them. That really what's going on in your brain is just electrons bouncing around and you're the product of those bounces and you don't really make decisions on your own. It's just the physical laws and properties going on in your brain. The word just there is doing a disservice. I think it's amazing that physical laws and firing electrons can produce a brain like mine that is capable of making choices, even if those choices are informed by external factors and pre-existing conditions. If you are watching this video of your own volition, that I'm watching this video of my own volition doesn't demonstrate that my volition could have been otherwise under identical conditions. Then the fact of the matter is, there has to be a God that can account for that free will that you as a person have. I can. I don't see how that follows. Many hold to libertarian free will without needing a god to account for it. But five proofs in a row, Kyle has just asked us to affirm how we feel about something. That's the opposite of proving something. And proof number six, human reasoning. Why human reasoning? Any creature with a brain from slugs to ants to chipmunks to reason. Reasoning can be defined as the mental process of making logical connections, drawing inclusions, or reaching judgments based on evidence, facts, and logical principles. It involves using rational thinking to analyze information, evaluate arguments, and arrive at justified beliefs or decisions. You see, we reason on a regular basis. We understand abstract ideas. If we were products of blind, chance, random processes over multiplied millions of years, reasoning and the laws of reasoning simply would have no explanation. The laws of reasoning would have no explanation if he means the commonly accepted principles of logic. We're talking about law of identity, law of non-contradiction, and law of excluded middle. Do we need God for A to be equal to A? Do we need God for A to be not non-A? Do we need God for statements to be true or false? No, these are merely properties of the universe. Human minds discovered them, but they are independent of minds. These were properties of our universe before life existed, no matter how you think life came to be. So his comments about the age of the universe and evolution are irrelevant. And yet we reason together on a regular basis. From where does reason arise? It's got no naturalistic, atheistic explanation. What explanation is needed for A being A and B being B? This is not a mystery. I don't know what Kyle has in mind when he thinks about a naturalistic universe. I'm guessing that he doesn't know either. Frankly, I'd be more apt to believe in God if, in our universe, that some days A stopped being A for no apparent reason. A universe with unchanging property is what you'd expect from a universe with no being behind it. Inconsistency is what would demand a creative creator be in action. Anthony Flew, the atheist who wrote Theology and Falsification, the most popular atheistic paper for the last hundred years, the last century. In 2006, he co-wrote a book titled, There is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Became a Believer. Really? Anthony Flew? Allow me to quote myself. Around 2004, as Flew was already in his 80s, he became influenced by Gerald Schroeder, an intelligent design proponent whose controversial ideas are roundly criticized by secular and Christian communities alike. Based primarily on the confidence and charisma of Schroeder, Flew began to lean toward the possibility of an Aristotelian god, who had no interaction with the universe, but may have kicked things off. Flew continued to reject the notion of a personal god who cares about humans. He never went that far. Quick to come alongside the wavering Flew were well-known resurrection apologist Gary Habermas and religious author Roy Abe Varghese, who seemed eager to use the philosopher as a poster child for conversion. But when pressed, Flew's commitment to the idea seemed to waver. He renounced the science of Schroeder as not up to date, instead deferring to Richard Dawkins, and he revised his introduction to God and philosophy to remove any details about his theistic position, and vowed to further stay out of religious discourse. And yet, the There is a God book that Wallace referenced hit shelves in 2007, with the author listed as Anthony Flew. When the New York Times sat down with Flew to talk about the book, he was repeatedly unfamiliar with the details found in the book. Eventually, Flew conceded that he had not written it. Varghese had. There are lots of other sordid details and accusations to be found. 
From my perspective, Flu seems like a man who had reached the point in his life where his capacity was at least somewhat diminished, and was disproportionately influenced by whomever the last person to speak to him was. Suffice to say that it is highly questionable to what Flu's views on God actually were, and more importantly, by what methodology he got there. The only thing we can say for sure is that he never capitulated to the Christian God hypothesis. He stated that his rule of life had always been to follow the evidence where it leads. And he said he followed that evidence. And it led him to the conclusion that there is a supernatural, intelligent God. There's good reason to suspect that Anthony Flew's final conclusions had more to do with a loss of mental faculties and manipulation by those around him than it had to do with following evidence. But even if I'm wrong about that, Flew specifically rejected the Christian God and held only to an impersonal deistic entity. This was a pretty bad example for Kyle to use. Let's let the evidence lead us to that same conclusion. While I remain completely open to new evidence and the notion that I'm wrong, following the evidence is what made me a former Christian. Be careful what you wish for, Kyle. If you'd like to hear more of this former Christian taking a look at the claims of Christians, tap on the thumbnail on screen now and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later.